Thank you for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here and to talk about something that I'm so passionate about. You're going to notice <laughs> that I'm quite passionate about it uh, and try to, you know, give some context also of the strategies that I'm going to share with you, considering stress management, recovery, and particularly in a, tra a trainer's job when we are a trainer and the, the, the dimensions that we need to take care and have a look on. So let me share my slides also. So a brief bio, I think you've read it. So I've been working as a psychologist. I mainly focus on work setting and really helping people navigate stress at work. So in different fields, in different sectors, in different professions. And as Marcos just previously mentioned, so being a trainer is, is actually, you know, full of challenges, but, I, but all professions have challenges. We just need to have the, the great strategies or to build in the better strategies to handle our stress factors or you know the the type of situations that that really uh, increase uh, our stress and diminish our well-being and also satisfaction with our professional life and that is what i've been doing for the past um 20 years almost of my life so to you know to really get going to deep of this context we're going to talk a lot about resilience what is resilience what isn't and also how do I see myself as a resilient person? And I would imagine that being a trainer, you have to have some kind of resilience built in because you have challenges when you are facing a group, when you have to, as you know, your lifestyle may be not very uh, consistent every day and you have a lot of changes that you need to navigate and challenges. So, but I was just wondering, you know, just reflect a little bit intentionally and do a check-in from zero to 10, when zero, I'm not at all resilient. And 10, I'm totally, just look at the last month, you know, the last four to three weeks. How do you consider that you were resilient, that you were able to navigate change or situations that, you know, arose in your life and your work that was unexpected, how we were able to cope with it, to find new solutions? Um, and why would you grade yourself from zero to 10 as that number? If you want to just share in the chat, it will be good. Even if I, I, I will not pick it up right now, we can we can discuss it and share it later on. But do consider how resilient how, have I been from this past three weeks in my life um, and the flexibility that I was able to to deploy, to, you know, to use in my professional and personal life and to navigate all the integration of life work um, in this past three weeks. Okay, just a few minutes. Think about it. Think about specific situations. It's, it always helps, you know, when we are dealing with more stressful situations or where we were feeling more tired. How did we cope with it? How we revert that tiredness in a way? Okay. So it changes. We are not all resilient all the time. And it's not a built-in character style. There are not resilient or non-resilient people uh, in a way we build the competence. It's also a very complex context. And we're gonna try in this session to link resilience and also well-being, and how can we have a more proactive and active way of building this resilience and at the same time, increase our um, self um, care strategies, more focusing on how we handle stress, if we are really using more active uh, ways of dealing with stress and at the same time, are we using the best recovery strategies while we are at work? So while we are delivering trainings, but also when we are outside of work and we are, you know, resting or coming back after um, after a training or a full week of training, which is very intensive and we need to consider how, what kind of recovery uh, strategies are we using. So as I was saying, resilient is actually actually a very complex competence so it's not a character it's not a personality trait it's something that we really built in and it's adaptive it means that it's the way we deal with issues with problems how we adapt to change how we can even turn negative experience into our um, learning experience or draw some meaning from this tenseful uh, situations that we have in our life whether it's uncertainty for my next assignment for my next work or my next project whether it's something that I'm uninspired, uh, you know, I've been working in this field for many years and I need to boost my motivation and find new ways to boost also my interest and curiosity again for the field and to, to, to improve also my skills and competences and, and methodologies while I deliver any kind of learning experience. 
It's also something very important because we are living in a bunny world, so very uncertain, very brittle, very fragile, very anxious. So it really resilience helps us to manage stress. So it means stress is not necessarily a negative process. Stress is the way that we adapt to the environment. We are built in to feel stress. But stress can be negative when it's experienced in a continuous and with no possibility of, you know, coming back to a more stable or recovered state when it's chronical. And stress at work, when chronic, it's normally leading to burnout and exhaustion, right? So the way resilience actually helps us to manage stress better. And also take pleasure and um, free ourselves from a very workaholic situation or very consumed by our work and our engagements um, and really enjoy life and enjoy the good things and value even the negative experience, draw lessons from it and use it later on and kind of create a narrative for ourselves that are that that is actually helping us to 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 build in, you know, to overcome challenges um, difficulties, uncertainty that can happen in our professionals and personal lives. It's actually drawn from multiple skills because whether we are resilient, it means that we communicate good with others. We have a good self-knowledge. We work on our self-knowledge and to really be able to, to, to know ourselves and to understand the signs of this stress, you know, when we are not feeling the positive stress, but the negative one, how am I feeling? And sometimes it's a very physical, for some people, the signs are very, what we call in psychology, psychosomatic, but for others are very emotional. You know, I, I feel very drained. I feel very sad or, you know, even I feel a lot of anger it can be a sign of stress also. So it means that we are, you know, um, uh, linked to our emotions, but also the emotions of others. So we have empathy. You know, the more resilient people also connect whether, uh, better with others and they handle better the conflicts. They have a higher self-control. And if we have also this uh, skill uh, developed, it means that we can also self-motivate, you know, navigate, you know, transitions in our career, you know, I want to change, you know, the field that I'm working or, you know, use my skills in a different skill, in a, in a different setting. And it means that we know how to handle stress and manage it more proactively and actively, but also that we recover and we know how to recover. We know what to do while we are at work and while even outside of work, we can combine the better strategies to really recover. Um, and it's a very important skill also because it 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 really uh, strikes a core uh, issue that also connects with our mental health resilience is about it's interesting because in physics resilience is actually the capacity of a material to really you know endure a major force or a major you know uh temperature higher temperature higher, pre higher pressure but then come back come back to the initial form but in in humans resilience is not about the same as in physics, because it's actually the flexibility to adapt. It means that our structure changes, we change, we adapt. And this meaning it's actually anchored in a learning process. For, so for trainers, it's interesting. It means that we are learning also in our lives, that we even if we are trainers, that doesn't mean that we are using the same learning strategies when it's concerning our stress and our well-being, our satisfaction, and how our capacity to adapt to the current context and particularly work context, but not only also, also, you know, our societal uh, context. And it's something that doesn't happen to us. We don't build resilience just being passively present to very threatening situations or difficult and challenging moments. We need to engage, you know, you, we need to be in the arena. It's an active and complex process. And we only build resilience. We can observe others. And we have, of course, social learning. But the real competence means that we were able to be in the action. We need to do the work, right? So it's not just witnessing or going through some experiences. It's actually proactively engaging, finding solutions, and adapting, and questioning ourselves. It means that we don't know everything. And we, we are not anchored in what used to work. So we have a more proactive and positive mindset means that we are actually oriented to change and we want to learn better ways to 
you know, handle our emotions, handle our sh- challenges at work? And how can we navigate this life and be, have more, you know, less unpredictability, more stability? Also, not stability perhaps in the context, but more stability in ourselves and what we can engage and learn from our lives and from our experience and also our professional experience. So it, it also comes, we have to do the work. So it has to kind of tap into individual strategies. One interesting aspect, and people think, oh, being resilient, it, ha- it has to be something within just intrinsic, you know, it's something that you, you know, just develop by yourself. We kind of depend on our positive and nurturing relationships and, you know, friends, family, colleagues, even at work to really be resilient. So our social support system, the way that we engage in relationships is crucial. So if I'm a a trainer, but if I have a great network as trainers, um, so if if I'm supported by my peers and my uh, collaborators in projects, if I have a good family and also friends at home, you know, where I'm based, that can I kind of engage with me, I'm more resilient because I have better social support. It means that even if I'm transitioning into a you know a more uh, exhausting period, I have the relationships to help me, you know, to to support me, to sometimes to just call it that I'm already having signs of you know exhaustion, and you need to rest and you need to take care of yourself. So actually having this um, very strong social support, it's crucial at work and in life to be resilient because we are not resilient because we are heroes. It has nothing to do with the Euro complex. It's something built in in our community, okay? Also, we learn to deal with the uncertainties. We accept the change. We are not someone that goes against what's happening. It's something we acknowledge that we are not pleased with what's happening, but we engage with the change. We accept the uncertainty and we try to find meanings or learnings in every situation, even something, a project that doesn't go well or some learning or some collaboration that was stressful. What can I draw from here? What can I take from the, this relationship or this situation to the next? And I avoid further mistakes. So, and we need to learn as we teach, as we share in our learning experiences with others as trainers we create moments for people to reflect and we know that we need to learn from our experience we cannot just stay the same we we need to really evolve as a human uh and also since we are working so many years in the same space or in the same profession imagine being a trainer for 10 years it means that we develop better strategies to balance everything to develop our competences our skills soft art, our collaborations. We we need to continuously evolve also our self-care. How can we balance our personal and professional life? How can we actually balance, you know, our lifestyle and traveling and the same, take care of our fundamental health habits, such as sleep and uh, eating well and uh, taking time to just relax and take care, you know, and uh, relax my, my nervous system after a very intense week, uh, week of training. So it's something that we need to engage, but it's not just individual. It's actually something built in, in, in the quality of the relationships and not always we consider this. And even if you look at a lot of the messages now about self-care, it's always individual, but it's not. You know, community helps a lot also to reinforce habits, to create um, rituals that really help whether, well, I'm at work, whether I'm out of work and can really boost our our resilience. Also, you know, even the state of the world, the state of our societies are not very optimistic, but try to really develop this kind of sense of seeing possibilities. Um, um, I don't know if you know an an author called Ange Roslin. He has an amazing book on statistic and showing that the world actually is getting better and human development and societal development, humanity development is getting better. So he he says, I'm not an optimist, but at least I see possibilities. I see growth. I see possibilities of change and I engage with this initiative. So try to build in a more optimistic view of your life, local life, community life, but also European or even uh, as a global citizen. And because optimism actually boosts our resilience. If we are completely pessimistic, it means that we are much more rigid 
and much more difficult to engage in change because we don't believe it. We don't believe that possibility of something better could emerge from that. Reach to people because, as I said before, um, relationships are crucial for our resilience. And also, don't close yourself and really analyze all the environment around you. You know, just don't close yourself in your own individual mind. Normally, our minds are very, not very, so we tend to believe that our minds are the truth, but they are not. <laughs> they are telling a story and we need to change that story constant, co continuously. We need to challenge that story and we need to reach out into the environment, test our hypothesis that we have about our lives, ourselves and what's working, what's not working, and really test it outside. We need to get out of our head to really test, you know, uh, and ask for feedback and engage with others to really learn about ourselves. It's not some, something that we just find within. Um, also, when we are more self-effective and we are, we have practical approaches to be effective. It means that we don't overwork necessarily. We tend to look at being um, efficient also. How can I really solve this challenge or you know, perform this task, deliver this training, but really balance and not e exhaust myself too much? And we're gonna, in a moment, I will be speaking about recovery. And we know that once we learn how to recover better, we actually get less tired out of work. We can compensate, we use better strategies to not be tired even after an intense you know, residential training for a week with a group. Afterwards, if we get enough experience, we also tap into good strategies to not feel drained after entirely drained, at least tired, but not entirely drained. And also learn to control your impulses because being resilient is not to react impulsively. On the contrary, is to observe, is to tap in to find better solution. It's also a creative process because it means that we don't go right away with the obvious answer to the issue and react negatively or um, with an intense, you know, uh, emotional reaction that could actually, you know, challenge or hinder a relationship or put us, you know, in a conflict and try to really connect and be empathetic with others. So it means that we can actually be more resilient if we are more connected and if we really, really try to be empathetic. We are not naturally empaths, okay? So this is something that we learn <laughs> and we need to keep on learning on our lives. So the more empath we are, the more resilient we are because we learn more about others, we regulate ourselves and others better and we manage more, much, much better our emotion because we don't feel threatened because we understand where this behavior or this reaction, reaction that this person has towards me or in that particular situation, whether at work or delivering a training or sor sorting a conflict in a project, we can actually manage our emotion better and don't react or overreact that could actually you know, increase our stress and, um, and of course, diminish our resilience. Okay, so I'll, I'll brief stop just to check if you have any comments, questions. Um, was this the, the idea about resilience that you had? Um, let me know. I'm going to try to look at the put it in the chat or raise your hand simply. Yeah. Yes, raise your hands and just. Electronic hand. Yeah. Okay, no comment in the chat. There's one. <laughs> No, shall I continue? So, there's a question. Is that really so that we are not naturally empaths? Asks Esther. Yes, in terms of the development, it actually it starts earlier. We can be empaths early, but we are not naturally. It's something that we learn socially also to connect with others and um, and and actually learn to be empathic. We are more self-centered and we learn to do. Socially, so we 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 kind of need the relationships to actually develop this this empathy. Actually, the lack of connection builds psychopathy, which is you know someone that cannot be empathetic about others. So it's the contrary. It's through the relationship that we learn to because being empath, it's not not just having emotional like um, emotional because it's not the same as just feeling the same. It's understanding the point of view of others and actually you know go out of your own needs and perspective and objectives in a relationship and really read the situation through the other's eyes. So it's not just to, to mimetize the emotion. That's not empathy. That's, that's, that's just a, a more, yes. And this is more, 
you know, built in, of course, because it helps with the connection. And then when you have a connection, then you build that at the afterwards. Yes. Yeah. Then we have from Rodolfo, who's connected from Rio Grande do Sul. Greetings to Brazil. Nice. He is asking, <laughs> is the author you referenced the co-founder? Yes. Yes. yes, 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 yes. Yes, he died, I think, some years ago, but it, he, I, I can't remember the name, Factfulness. He has a book, very interesting, and he kind of, and he also has a TED Talk, an amazing TED Talk, and he kind of shows what is to be a possibilistic, which is not necessarily an optimist, but it shows a lot of data about uh, the development, um, human development, and you know the states of the entire world. And that normally we tend to view the world as much worse than it is. And it's getting better. You know, a lot of statistics show that the the, the quality of life and work is getting better, you know, on the whole. But of course, we are centered um, in the Western world and we tend to view all the news and the, all the news are much more negative and tend to just focus on the things that are not working at all. Yes. Of course, in recent years, that might have changed. I think we are a little bit worse, but, <laughs> but I think that the foundation keeps on publishing all these data concerning um, uh, concerning uh, the the state of development and some indexes and statistics that are important for us in terms of human development. Sandra, wait, where was it? You know, yeah, she was saying, I was thinking about people that study in boarding schools as less sympathetic. Hi, Sandra. You turned on your camera up. Hi. And Rodolfo added, your question is very important. The psychology of emotional and cognitive empathy as yeah. an answer to the question. And really, feel free also, since we're not so managed, you can in so many, you can also directly speak to the mic so we hear your voice. You can say where you're from and say your things. So. I don't need to read your things in the chat. It's lovely to hear your voice. I actually don't know the data. I, I, I went to a boarding school, but I don't know the data if we are less empathetic or not. <laughs> um, but I don't know the data about it. But uh, yeah, but I actually went to a all female boarding school, which is, was a very strange educational experience. Okay, shall I continue a little bit more? Yes. Yeah, seems that's it for the first wave and we'll have a next stop anyway. So let's continue exactly. Okay. okay, so I think you know this because there's a lot of coaching um, around this team, but it's very important to understand that not only the emotional parts of, um, of our set of behaviors are important, but also our thoughts and the pattern of our thoughts are very important. And this is, you know, concerning the, the mindset, which is the framework of our thoughts and, you know, we were mentioning, you know, to develop a more positive mindset, this is actually catalytic to motivation, proactivity, problem solving, and also well-being. And the feeling that we are more able to deal with our lives as it is, or, you know, to implement change when we want to. So we believe in our own self-efficacy to implement change and to address it in a more, more proactive way. And so mindset and the type of interpretations that we do are critical. So understanding our patterns of thoughts and how they connect to our emotions and also, of course, our behaviors. And this is linked to a more conscience and, in, you know, it, it, it builds your capacity to actually learn new ways to adapt to your challenges at work. Um, and, you know, the fixed and growth mindsets, uh, you could probably teach them also or have already engaged with the concept, but it's very it's very critical because we can see how this relates to all negative outcomes, considering resilience, considering well-being at work, for instance. Because when, when people kind of develop symptoms, for instance, of burnout, normally the negative mindset is very, very strong, you know, anchored in their, in their way of being. It means that uh, they don't see any point of trying. They don't believe that any change is possible, but they tend to be very rigid also, not just on their thoughts, but on their feelings because they experience the same emotions repetitively with no change because the behavior stays the same. So if you don't engage in change, then of course the fixed mindset kind of, it's a self prophecy because you don't believe you can change. So you don't change. And of course this creates all negative emotional states that endure in your life. So we, I think, you know, in this course or in other moments of this training, the holistic training, you work, you, you learn about mindfulness. I will not 
because you can just start it. It's actually not spiritual at all. You know, the word mindfulness, the technique developed that I'm mentioning, um, uh, it's actually John kabat Singh that developed in the 70s, I'm not sure. But it's actually, you know, a, a practice of focused attention. And you can actually do it, you know, not just laying down or sitting down. You can actually do it while engaging in walking or even, you know, washing the dishes. It's actually something very simple and it connects and it builds, you know, your ability to focus your attention that really helps to, 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 to really be conscious about your the pattern of your thoughts. And then, of course, substitute negative thoughts to a more positive or at least less negative thoughts. And really reflect on decision making. Some of the issues that we struggle with, you know, stress at work and being exhausted, sometimes it's lack of decision. We don't engage in behaviors that actually correct situations or change the relationships or, you know, um, help to manage a conflict at work or in our personal lives. And this, of course, is connected to a lack of decision making. We need to take, you know, consider the action, not just reflecting, because change happens when we engage in concrete actions and try and, and keep on trying to find the better actions to solve our issues. So it's also very important to, to understand that it's not just about the reflection process or changing the narrative inside me or the story that I'm telling myself, that it's also to engage in concrete actions. What can I change? And coaching really helps with that part. And therapy, sometimes it's a, not, not all kinds of therapy, of course, and I think we had a, a webinar concerning the different kinds of therapy that we can use, but coaching really helps with this, you know, proact to, to really focus on the action. Don't focus too much on diagnosing the issue, but or, or complaining, <laughs> which is even worse. And it's a very fixed mindset indeed, but really, you know, focus on the challenge ahead. What can I do to myself? I have this big, big project coming up. I'm feeling already overwhelmed. How can I really start and have a plan to tackle this? And really focus on, you know, you know, don't don't avoid, don't try to control your procrastination and face challenge much more head on. And invest in yourself, build the right training experiences. Sometimes it doesn't need to be formal. It could be something like taking time off, really investing in reading key books that I know that will help me to really be more conscious about my personal development and can actually boost my motivation at work and also my performance because trainers also, of course, have high level of social competences and communication. So it's also, you know, your individual personal kind of feeds into, you know, the way that you can actually use and capitalize all your potential while you're working as a trainer. And as we said, social support. So it means that a growth mindset depends on the quality of our network and the capacity that we have to really find inspiration also in others, not just in ourselves and not, you know, just not like necessarily people that are the same as we are, but people that kind of inspire us to think differently and to act differently and to explore different things. Like-minded, not, not necessarily the same because the same is boring and normally doesn't contribute to our growth and development. Also, our decisions, if we stop being so automatic, Take time to don't react or overreact in the moment. We have a conflict. We are delivering a training. We, you know, with another train, with another, uh, another trainer. Can we just think twice, reflect a little bit, start by analyzing a little bit the context of the situation? What happened? How did I interpret it? How the other, you know, what was the behavior, the behavior on the concrete situation that really kind of provoked this emotion? And at the same time, I'm always responsible for my own emotions. So it means that I need to, you know, to take ownership of that. It was not just the other that provoked. And this, you know, of course, nonviolent communication helps a lot if you would like to work uh, on the way to deliver to the other and to engage in changing their behavior. And at the same time, you know, we tend to look at success as the same thing, like a big apotheosis, you know, like a big moment. But success, actually, it's, a, it's an experience that we need to be celebrating very small achievements. When we are, you know, in a very tense period and we have not been on the top of our game in terms of energy, in terms of, but we are still able to deliver, to close it, to, we need to celebrate that, you know, our our persistence, our dedication, even if it's not something superb or that we didn't receive any feedback or any extraordinary feedback, it was just okay, but at least it was consistent. And sometimes I think 
in our professional lives, we tend to just look at, I know, I would like to, you know, a big project. I'm, I'm in search of huge achievements while we just lose track of the process. And actually this growth mindset is built in and we learn how to celebrate small achievements before we can actually engage in celebrating bigger ones or even not be too anxious about achieving a bigger achievement and, and be able to enjoy as it goes, as the process goes. And where we are in our, you know, our track, you know, we are not all the same, uh, exactly do, uh, doing the same things. Also, when we look at stress, there's a lot of, you know, we can do a lot of meditation, we can do exercise, really helps a lot with stress. But it's important to just differentiate when we are actually using more active coping. Coping, it's actually dealing with stress from passive coping. And active coping, you know, we've been talking a lot about changing the way we perceive the situation, changing our thoughts, and then, of course, improving the way that we can actually, you know, use concrete strategies. Imagine at work. If we only use strategies to handle our stress when we are not tackling the issues at work, I am, you know, I have too much to do. I need to really set my priorities. I need to organize and plan my, you know, the next three months of work. I need to, you know, avoid procrastinating. So I need to seek social support. I need to have advisement, you know, on how to deal with specific issues. This is something that we can actually is related to the challenge, to the stress factor in, 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 a, in a more psychological um, language. So it means that we are tackling the issue at work. We are tackling what is actually causing stress. And we are not just avoiding or trying to divert ourselves from this challenge. We have a conflict with the supervisor, with, you know, like a, a colleague or a project or a, a client. You know, we have a lot of conflicts with clients also sometimes. So we are actually trying to improve and managing those arising situations that are challenging. And this is really engaging with the issues that actually provoke stress. And so this is more active. It could be a more cognitive coping, so it means that we change just the perception, or it could be just the strategies, how we handle the situation, how we you know, seek more um, improved you know, conflict management, how we seek social support, how we plan. You know, let's have a plan to, you know, to avoid this from happening again and to really deal with the problem face on. So like heads, you know, like don't avoid, don't just relax and try to divert your thoughts away from the issue, but really go into it. And actually what science shows is that active strategies are necessary for us to improve, you know, our perceived satisfaction at work and our perceived balance and integration of life work. So if we are not using those it means that we are a little bit unbalanced and we tend to just use more the passive ones, ignoring the situation, letting it resolve by itself, not taking decisions and denying the existence of the problems, just being distracted by other things, not thinking about the problem, minimizing the situation and, of course, to depress ourselves with the issue and just, you know, uh, be really, you know, just thinking about the negative. So this is very passive. There are, there are scientific studies that actually show, for instance, a lot of meditation, a lot of mindfulness is good for you. But for instance, for stress and recovery and to build really resilience at work, you really need to have active uh, coping strategies. Because if you only engage with meditation, and this is common in a lot of companies that have like meditation rooms and everything, but then, you know, you still need to address what are the really stress factors identified by people that work in that setting. So you need to always tackle uh, more actively the, the issues. You know, we have a conflict. We are not, you know, understanding, uh, you know, uh, how to navigate this project or we are not getting enough clients and this builds a lot of anxiety. So we need to tackle the problem. So, um, but a combination of both are necessary. We cannot only be in active coping. We also need to combine it with more passive strategies also to, you know, to, to regulate ourselves and emotions and, and to, to recover. But the same, the combination is the better, okay? Just a remark also, as I mentioned before, when we are dealing with, you know, we, we want to promote our health, we want to reduce our stress. There's all kinds of strategies that we can use. Some are more focused on the body, some are more focused on the mind, on changing our thoughts and perception of the situation. But also, all, others are also very focused on context. And context is also physical context. Um, so it means that 
we can have a combination of these two strategies. Space is very important for our regulation. You know, the, the reduce of stimuli in the environment, it's very important. We still have a very basic, not basic, but very basic nervous system and it has its laws. So it doesn't, it haven't changed in, in, <laughs> since the beginning of um, uh, humanity and almost sapiens species. So it means, sapiens, sapiens. So it means that we need to comply with the laws of our, you know, uh, biology, but at the same time, combining both, you know, for some people, exercise, uh, walks in the nature are the key for them, you know, getting outside, outside the house, of course, and uh, confined environments. And also, you know, just focus on the body and the movement, not necessarily physical intense activity, but focusing on body and movement and kinesthetic uh, also intelligence and built in this capacity is enough for them to regulate and to actually promote their psychological health. Some people like to reflect, like to write, like to have moments of meditation heavily and really go into, you know, different levels of conscience and cognition and insight about their own issues. And some others are very, very dependent on context and, you know, what, what is the space that I'm in, the quality of the relationships that I'm in, and this is very important. And it's very important, of course, to promote our health. So this, you know, I'm not going to take a lot of time. <laughs> so, of course, it's about physical exercise, health, you know, all alcohol and other side. Take a break from technology, disconnect, of course, from all blue screens, and particularly really really look at your sleep um, there are currents in psychology and more clinical psychology that now are discovering that a lot of you know um, psychological problems actually they have we don't know for sure if the cause or if sleep issue is the cause or is the consequence or the symptom so it's it's still something very interesting um, and I really like the TED talk about you know the, the expert about sleep I can't remember his name but um, if you look at TED, a TED Talk about sleep, sleep is your superpower. I think it's the name of the TED Talk. I can't remember the name of the author. He has a great book about sleep and it's really important. And actually, and I'm going to mention is this uh, a little bit later. It's also about if you learn, it's very interesting. If you learn something outside of your you know, professional life, if you learn new skills, even fun skills, fun activities, but if you invest in personal development, learning any kind of craft or any kind of activity that it's not necessarily related to you, to you as a trainer, it actually helps a lot because you have other focus of development and you are not just focusing your development of work. You know that you can learn different things and different tasks. And I think, you know, a trainer kind of, you know, builds in a lot of, um, skills and uh, activities because he explores for normally but but still it's very important to to, to really learn outside of work also and it, it kind of helps a lot with uh, managing stress and also builds in resilience so the final topic that i'm going to approach it's more about recovery and there are three type of recovery strategies that we can use while we are at work and it means that we can actually design our day at work or, you know, when we are working, whether delivering a training or, you know, preparing a training or even, you know, uh, doing a report or evaluation on a, on a project. So it means that we can actually use strategies that help us recover. So it helps us to actually design our day at work in a better way. First of all is selection. So as I would tell you, we don't procrastinate, we select, but we don't select because we are tired or select the easiest task. This is a selection when we are already feeling less, um, you know, effective. So it means that we do good prioritization, good planning, and we anticipate. So it means that we prepare, we anticipate, we invest in the areas that we know that are giving more value, that will immediately put us on a better performance later on. And we decide, we decide, we intentionally decide how, you know, what strategies we are going to focus on to prepare that project to really engage in that training. So it means that we kind of select and also uh, invest in the areas that we know that will build more value for us and that we could actually give more value to others. For, second, it's also about optimization. We don't do the process of work the same way. We need to build in competences abilities to be able to achieve the desired result, but also developing ourselves. 
and using better strategies every time. So it means that when we build experience over our professional life, we actually find adaptive ways to work at the same level, but at the same time with less effort. But it's not being, um, I'd say, it's not just not doing our best job. It's because we learn how to do it in a way that it's more sustainable for ourselves. So it means that we need to invest continuously on our development, use the tools that could actually optimize the way we deliver trainings, the way we engage in projects, and not just do the exact same process every time with no possibility of optimization over process. We do this when we deliver a first training, we go for the second, we learn something. We learn how to also deploy this or you know deliver this training better, but also with less um, exhaustion. You know, because we know we learn more about the process and the adaptive mechanisms. And this is very important. We need to actually build in the strategies to uh, job craft, which is the term of adapting. We need to adapt. And not all people like to work the same way. So it's also something that we need to 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 interesting. And then we don't need to focus on only our individual skills. And sometimes I think when we are freelancing, for instance, we have this tendency to just, you know, I have to have it all. I have to have all the skills on myself. I have to use every kind of uh, strategies or technology or whatever. So use others, use technology, use everything that you can to really maintain your level of performance, but being able to be sustainable over time. So sometimes when we don't implement changes at all and we do exactly the same things, it means that we are not learning how to do better with less effort or at least less uh, tiredness you know, from the process because all learning is about to really compensate with technology, with others, learning from others and, you know, changing anything that we can change in the way that we perform our job or our work. So outside of work, this view, I think, you know, you've heard about it. We need to distance ourselves. So we finish a training and we need to have this kind of transitional period that we detach ourselves completely from, you know, that experience. For some people, this is very easy because the change in physical space is enough. For others, it's not as easy. They need to engage in more uh, uh, mental strategies to really be able to detach themselves. So create this physical electronic barriers, create a transition experience. How can I you know, just leave a, a one week residential training? What can I do after that could actually put me completely in another different uh, psychological space because I detach myself from that experience and I can actually recover better. Okay. This, of course, from people that work in the same setting, they really need to disconnect. And sometimes it's very difficult. And also set a time where you are not disturbed by work, uh, even if it's not a regular office hours. How can I structure my day in a moment that I'm, I'm not thinking? I'm, you cannot be constantly thinking about work. It has to have space determined in your agenda, in your psychological space, but also your physical space. It helps a lot. Finally, of course, uh, relaxation and meditation. And I think you, perhaps most of you already do. We need this process of relaxing. Some people it could be a walk with a dog outside. Some people could be um, a massage, a meditation, could be some, some kind of way that we can actually, you know, reboot ourselves and build back our energy. And sometimes after very intense periods, we need a very prolonged relaxation period. You know, we need to be a little bit more kind with ourselves and take time to really do this. And also, as I was saying before, we need to have other goals in our lives of learning, build other skills, have positive hobbies, practice any kind of activity, whether sports or not, that build skills. So if we are having this mastery experience outside of our you know, trained competence and skills framework. We are just enjoying ourselves in very simple activities, but that actually bring us a lot of value. And this actually is active rest, right? It kind of built in a more uh, fruitful and positive re recovery. And finally, and this is very tricky for, you know, the lifestyle of a typical, very international trainer. We need to have some sense of control about our non-professional activities. So it means that, if I'm just focusing, you know, I, I, I do my management of the time that I'm at work, but then while I'm not at work, I don't structure that time. I don't define what I'm going to do in the next two weeks or the next week that I'm not actually engaging in any kind of training period. 
wrong. We need to plan our time, even if we are not working, or at least arrange and have strategies for non-working time and really define what we're going to do. Because once we don't plan, normally nothing happens and then we don't recover as it, 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 could, it could actually be the potential of recovery that we can have. So plan your free time, plan your breaks, plan your holidays. Sometimes when we travel too much for work, you, 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 you messed up a bit and you, conf, you, know, you, miss, you, you mixed the time of travel for leisure and the time of travel for work. And they are not the same. The experience shouldn't be anything near the same. So don't, don't, don't travel and then visit friends that are also trainers. And at the same time, we are discussing work while you're staying. So try to really separate the moments and engage in activities that are fully leisure and, you know, not messed up all the time with also work. And, and sometimes, you know, in, 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 in perhaps in your lifestyle or as an tra international trainee, we, we, it's very uh, perceived from, from a psychologist's point of view that sometimes things are so intertwined that they don't separate, you know, different kinds of experience they can have and engage in the full recovery. As you know, and of course, we, we said that not just the optimism, but being grateful, of course, you know, and psych the positive psychology also sells, uh, uh, talks a lot about that and focusing on your strengths, build a relationship, seek help when you need, and also try to avoid being too fixated on things that went wrong, people that hurt you or said something very negative. So try to really, you know, um, practice forgiveness and distance yourself from any kind of uh, situation past that could be trauma. There's there's um, a, a recent book actually um, that kind of mentions that if we are only talking about what happened in our past, that doesn't help in terms of our psychological health. So imagine even the typical forms of psychotherapy when we go into our you know in, uh, infancy and, and childhood and then we try to blame our parents and always talking about the trauma that we live it doesn't necessarily help. So focusing much more on recalling the positive, try to engage on the potential. I already have these strengths, set goals, and then of course, be consistent with the health, the health style and change if needed across time. Um, and practice mindfulness, create flow. This is very interesting because flow, I don't know if you know, there's a, a huge field of research in flow state and it's very aligned with creative professionals, but not only. And it's interesting because I think it applies a lot to your experience as a professional a trainer, international trainer. Sometimes we completely lose track of time when we are carrying on, you know, our training, our projects. It's actually not bad, you know, to be so absorbed. It actually, it kind of, it relates to some kind of protection because the more the flow we feel in our uh, work, um time and the time that we invest for working activities the actually this is very protective because we feel so engaged and so absorbed by work that it actually promotes more uh, you know satisfaction engagement and then of course well-being and the health outcomes of the work and try to really constantly being on the search of something new for yourself and as a take, take time to laugh and don't take uh, I think a good don't take life so seriously. It 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 should be something that you could be fruitful and engage, even if you are facing, you know, imagine some challenges, financial issues also relating to not having enough work. But really, you know, engage with life and understand that okay, that's the challenge. So let's try it out and build new strategies to deal with it. Okay. So from my part. <laughs> And then I open the floor for comments, questions, and do open, you know, for uh, live questions. I think that's that's very interesting. Let me check also the chats and see if we. Yes, there has been some things. Okay. Yeah, so I need to do myself. <laughs> you were talking about the growth mindset. Uh, mindset. She said that uh, sometimes, when, even when you have a growth mindset, it, you can still be prone to burn up anyways. And maybe even because of having a growth mindset, you might be seeking perfection with yourself on the stress. I need to reply to that, that the growth mindset is not the only antidote to burnout, but actually it does not equate perfectionism, but rather celebrates failure and progress. So Mirella also said, if I may add, observing mistakes and trying to have it in the same moment can serve as lectures. 
Then we shared also some links on this TED talk you mentioned, the super power of sleep. So we shared yes. this link. Mm -hmm. And we talked about not mixing pleasure, cool. leisure, leisure and work. Beatrice said, yeah, it's very hard to plan your leisure time and not to mix it. But it's true that it's very important to implement. Yeah. And also now on the framework of your baggage of cognitive and emotional resources. That's a uh -huh. question for you, actually. <laughs> Have you developed the framework of your baggage of cognitive and emotional resources proposal? How would you start? Uh, what do you mean, Rodolfo? Can you share a bit, a little bit about your question? Turn on the mic, exactly. <laughs> oh, hi, thank you very much for for this webinar. It's so so useful. Um, you mentioned in your in your recovery phase strategies that um, a way to develop, for example. Um, no, sorry, that was part of the after work strategies, I yeah. think. Yeah, and it was specifically about experience control. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned that this baggage of cognitive and emotional resources, I found it very, very interesting, like having it as a concept. So I was just wondering if you have like structured that baggage. Mm -hmm. No, I think you, let me let me go back. So it's, a, it's about experience control, right? Yes. So a baggage, it, it's not, it's not a, a scientific term. It's just, you need to be able to have, as you have your trainer toolbox, right? We all have our trainer toolbox with our strategy exercises, you know, our approaches, our methodologies. So I think it's also a concept that we need to keep, keep on building also our personal um, cognitive and emotional resources ourselves to deal, you know, with the challenges of stress, you know, with overcoming any kind of um, negative experience in our lives. And what I mean is that you could use more cognitive resources, such as, you know, you use meditation, you use journaling, you have time for yourself to do some, you know, like a retreat, for instance, and this could be your, you know, part of your tools. Um, uh, it's a baggage or a, a toolbox as 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 I would 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 say, and then also, what are your emotional resources? How can you use more emotional? Do you share with others? Do you discuss? Do you do you, do you, do you focus on building very strong and um, um, positive relations in the sense that are able to you know regulate yourself? Because you know it's it's hard to just individually regulate all your emotions. And in the relationship, when you share when you um, share the load <laughs> that you're feeling. Sometimes, you know, in very close relationship, you are, are actually uh, are able to regulate them. But it's also sharing with others, seeking social support, seek, see, seeking even formal support if you need some kind of intervention or psychotherapy, or even if it's a, you know, a different kind of approach to therapy, what can I do and how can I really have this toolbox? And the toolbox needs to be updated. So imagine when I was younger, I, you know, I just use exercise and it was enough. But now, you know, my life has changed so much. I have some issues that I need to regulate and exercise is not enough. no more. So I, I need to diversify a little bit the way that I'm dealing with it. And it could be cognitive. It could be emotional strategy that I can use to actually cope with this. So it's not something formal, but it's to really build, because resources could be within you. Right. So strategies that deploy yourself. So imagine cognitive reframing, right? In you know, journaling, um, meditating. Uh, it could be uh, so seeking social support, build strong and connected relationships, spend time with family and friends, and really, you know, have moments of true connectedness could be an emotional resource. So, but it's also built in the relationships in the context. So it's not just something that we can only individually resources, for instance, if you work. It, at work, we resources are also, you know, the quality of interactions in a team for a project, you know, the, the level of recognition that you feel that could actually, you know, I'm, I'm doing something useful and valid and I'm, 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 feeling, I'm feeling validated at work. This is also a very important emotional resource that we get from a work experience. So it's actually, how can I build and diversify this tool box and not just focusing what I see a lot of people doing is that they only do like one or two things to help cope, you know, with this a very demanding and intensive work experience. And one or two things or one or two tools might not be enough. So diversify and build up, you know, and experience others. You know, like I remember, you know, Anita is here. She's a very dear friend of mine. And like two years ago, she mentioned, you know, why don't you try dance movement therapy? You know, I've 
explored other ther types of ther therapy. I'm also a psychologist, so it's very hard for me to not see what the therapist is doing. But then I tried something that I didn't have any kind of experience and it helped me a lot. So be open. You know, I never try it out, but let's try it out. You know, it's a different way of dealing with issues. Why not? And we tend to be very rigid and we, we keep on using the same strategies to recover or to re-energize ourselves after a very intense period of work. And sometimes it doesn't work. It's not enough. So it means that we build up this tiredness all the time. We don't have this daily recovery or even, you know, periodic recovery after intense periods. And then it starts to, um, uh, we say, you know, be uh, something chronic. We cannot get back. And then we kind of lose our, also our cognitive uh, resources, such as attention and concentration and the capacity to work and deliver our work in the best possible uh, way. Um, so it's actually diversify your strategies and understand that stressful and adverse events um, of your workday, of your life, they will be there for you to face them. It's, it's, quite, it's actually impossible to not have uh, stress challenges because it's the way that we adapt to the environment. So it's not a negative concept in terms of psychology, and uh, but we are experienced in high numbers and with the elevated frequency and severity, negative stress symptoms, which is distress. So it means that we are not able to recover and get back. I don't know if I answered the, the question, but... Anita has something to add, I think, here. I, I have a question as well. Um, thank you. Thank you for the input. I also found it very useful. Um, you were talking about the importance of being deliberate and very intentional about how we shape our um, work uh, runs and also how we uh, shape and how, how deliberate we are in our choices for our after work, uh, for our lives outside of work and how this matters. Um, I, I, I think that this includes well, a lot of the things you said, like prioritization, making choices, you know, choosing what tasks are going to, you know, make the needle kind of move into the right direction, being clear about your goal, etc. cetera. But um, for, for us that, um, I mean, not me, just I'm asking for a friend. Um, <laughs> for us that are uh, a bit more neurodivergent, that are a bit more spicy up here, um, Sometimes it's really hard to make that prioritization. Sometimes it's really hard to um, have a have a clear direction on how to manage either our, our working time or outside of working time. You know, fog kicks in, confusion kicks in. Um, do you have any suggestions for my friend? Yeah, if you if you work individually, you might need to develop some kind of nudging strategies to confine yourself to put your bigger tasks into smaller tasks and then put it in the agenda and then have nudges and sprints, right? And neurodivergent people really need to be structuring, you know, uh, in a very, uh, they need nudges and they need to be confined more than people that are not so di neurodivergent. But if you work in a team, I think for neurodivergent profiles, why not, you know, decompose the big plan in small tasks with others? And try to really come up with strategies to plan also with others because they sometimes in a team are, for instance, if you work in a team, sometimes are people that are very good with the, the composition, you know, the planning and whatever. And then you need the nudges to comply with the plan, right? A little bit like that. But I think at least the, the, the part of the compensation is also about this, you know, in very uh, diverse teams, people contribute differently and help each other. You know, in things that I don't do as well, or I'm not as, you know, um, it, it doesn't flow, right? <laughs> there are tasks that simply doesn't flow with us and we need to confine ourselves. Imagine I have a hard time writing. So most of the writers, if you read about their habits, they structure everything. They avoid all distraction. They put the nudges in and they are very, you know, in that periodic, they really need to be very um, confined in the process. But for the part of planning, they need others. They need, you know, a mentor, a guider, or someone in the team that are more prepared to do that. I think sometimes we need, we are blocked, for instance, and we don't uh, reach, reach out, you know. So sometimes it's just advisement or help me with this, you know, how can I, you know, 
disconstruct this and it will help you because sometimes it will just stop the procrastination because you another strategy that i would say is that to to to, to really be able if someone has a problem with deadlines for instance you know have a fake deadline and then you know have someone that is expect, expecting already the fake deadline so i i know that the deadline is there but i create a fake deadline and i have someone we're expecting for it and this is the type of nudging and you know like kind of you have to have a box um a, a little bit you know like to create those moments of focus and you know eliminate all the distractions but they have some support while doing it i would say because if you are so alone sometimes we get too anxious because, oh, I should have been working and I'm not working. And, th and then you start with just, you know, dealing with the emotions from the process and not necessarily, you know, just confining. I'm going to work. And the Pomodoro technique, I don't know if you know, but it's very useful. It's short periods of intense work. And then you stop and then you do a pause and then you come back. But you have to come back and you have to have nudges. Um, my my husband has a attention deficit. They, he has like a sign in his phone for everything. He needs to have everything marked to be able to have the routine, you know, in the morning or, you know, if he needs to do something, he, he marks everything. He has to have those, those very high. <laughs> now it's time to go to the back. No, now it, so, so you need to build this structure in your work. And if you need help to structure, perhaps another person in the team could actually be very good with this. And then you just comply with the plan and have the nudges built in, I would say. But of course, it's a learning process. And it's, sometimes it doesn't work everything. So it's not... A, a, a no fail strategy <laughs> you need to and and also attentive deficit with the exhaustion you know digital exhaustion that we have we are also facing you know problems with our attention and focus not just uh people with already identified neurodivergent uh issues or challenges and meanwhile mirella had to leave and gives a big thank you to you and says she could really take some key sentences and Rodolfo shared some resources on how to ADHD. Yes, ADHD. <laughs> there are also apps now, I think, with a lot of tools for people with uh, with ADHD. Yeah, it's also something interesting at the workplace. They are starting to discuss this. It's interesting, you know. Now companies are more aware that they need to set up, you know, the the, the work design in a way to be, you know, um, helpful for everyone. Uh, considering neurodivergent people and the way that we need to work differently and we need to have better strategies. Yes. Esther, lately I've been treating every deadline as fake. Yes. <laughs> There's <laughs> a question by Kerstin before us. Oh, sorry. Uh, a statement and a question regarding after. I agree with you. Rest and sleep is so important. But in very stressful times, this is the advantage to cut our minds from daily workload. Do you see difference between genders and strategies to fall asleep? Are there strategies to learn around? Yeah. There's some differences in stress management um, between genders. Yes. Uh, some studies show that, for instance, emotional strategies to cope with stress are much more, you know, uh, present with uh, with uh, with uh, women. But um, it's interesting because the social connection, actually, they, they search for different things. So it doesn't mean that men don't search for, imagine, social connection and social support, but they just engage in different activities. So women are more prone to just, you know, emotional dumping strategy. So just sharing, sharing, sharing. But men use other type of strategies, sharing, you know, an activity, sometimes sports or sometimes, you know, not engaging with the problem. So there are some differences in active coping and passive coping that some studies show, but um, not necessarily linked with the outcomes. We know that, you know, anxiety and depression are a little bit more prevalent in w women, but for instance, you know, suicide and other issues are, are more prevalent in men. So it, it, there are different kinds, but what, what I find interesting, it, 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 it really needs to be focused on each individual. The strategies are not, you know, female or male. We just need to, to understand that we need to have a good balance of active and passive strategies and also diversify the way that we recover, the way that while working and outside of work. And people are not the same necessarily. So really respect the diversity. What I find more, more strange is that when we go to a training and said, you know, if you use this strategy, this will solve your stress. There's no such thing in the literature. 
there are different techniques proven with very good results, but then it depends on each one of us and how we adapt to it, right? Because for some people, meditation is not, you know, it's not the tool. Exercise is much better. For others, they really need to time by themselves a lot. And others need connection and need social life, very intense social life. So it depends on your needs and really assess the needs and then deploy the strategies that you need. And we change. So it's not static, right? I was wondering, Liliana, since we only have 10 minutes left, okay, we can maybe take one last question by Marina. And then I think it would be nice if you still present the booklet you prepared. Yeah. Show it, yeah? yeah, Marina, go ahead. And then I will just brief you on, uh, I have a... a some exercises as a to-do <laughs> and to help with your reflection further uh, that I will brief after. But go ahead, Marina. I had such a responsibility, but I, I was just thinking that uh, uh, lately I'm, I'm worried more about uh, my my teams, our colleagues' uh, well-being, and somehow I think that uh, I should be helpful because I am the source of the problem in a way that I'm bringing them the work. And then it's this emotional ups and downs that they are like, uh, sometimes they um, they say it's very hard. Yeah, it's very hard to deal with that you have an intense project period when they're very involved emotionally and there is a pull. And then I cannot, it's, it's hard to bring them back. Like I'm ready to focus on the next thing, but they fall apart so i don't know there's a miracle strategy i guess no but but i think you know it's a very common challenge in project management for instance it's very well researched also that the most the biggest problem in project management it's not technical or planning or it's just the you know engaging people managing when they are not you know uh, able to deliver to meet the deliverables to meet the deadline I think one important uh, thing to consider if you are leading a team is how do you handle when they are not, you know, delivering on time? How do you discuss this and how this feedback actually integrates in a way that is constructive and you kind of try to find a solution? Is it because the task was not clear enough? It's because they need support. They are not really, you know, they are not as experienced or as autonomous in the task as I considered previously. Or they are competent, but they are just through a rough period emotionally and they lack confidence. And I need to, you know, build that confidence to be able to, to help them form better. And I would say during this process, it's never positive to just leave people um, unsupported. You know, what is it? It's more um, a task oriented support. It's more an emotional and I have to be available for that. And sometimes we are not because we are so focused on just the objective and, um, you know, quantitative aspects of, you know, we need to deliver. This is the important that we forget that relationships and, you know, really creating this moment of support. Sometimes it unlocks, you know, people just need some kind of pep talk, you know, to be oriented, to be able to sometimes people procrastinate because they feel overwhelmed. They don't know how to start to just, you know, have a meeting, kickstart kick start the task with them and then leave them and then have a follow-up meeting and then you structure. As I was saying before to Anita, sometimes we need to help people structure this decomposition of the work itself. And then we let them go and they are already oriented. So it doesn't need to be only emotional. The support, it could also be very uh, task-oriented planning or just you know trying to simplify the process as it is in small takes, engage with them and then, okay, so let's talk tomorrow and be available, I think, you know, because if we are just too focused on these not meeting, so the performance is, you know, it's not okay, this it doesn't help. I think in handling a project, you really need to be very attentive to others. You're true, you're right. At the same time, um, implement changes when needed. I would say, you know, even if the person, you know, was supposed to do something, but if it's not available, have the flexibility to, you know, that, that's what we sometimes, um, when we are intervening in an organization, considering stress, sometimes managers think, oh, but I cannot change 
anything about the work itself. Yes, you can you can change tasks, you can support, you can deliver to others, you can delegate. So there's a lot of things that you can actually do to the tasks themselves and go around the team. And sometimes you don't have time for the support. Another member in the team can support, can help. So I don't know if I help with <laughs> some of the, the the strategies. Yes, yes, yes. Thank you. It's very um, confirming a lot of things and giving new ideas as well. Thank you so much. Great. Also, thank you for sharing all these resources in the chat. And Liliana, maybe now yes. with the seven minutes left, okay. it's good to see what so, you prepared. So just a briefly to a little bit of homework. I like homework, but it's more like you, you can you can can see it as a learning project <laughs> or a learning diary after the, the webinar. But so I built this little deck that Marcos will share with you afterwards or at the chat. I'm not, I'm not sure uh, how it will go, but it will reach to you. No, no issues. So a little bit. The first exercise, it's just, you know, a quick checklist. It's not a test. It's just a checklist. And you go about a little bit of the patterns of feelings, thoughts, uh, and uh, there's a, miss, a T missing there and behaviors. Um, and then you analyze each sentence and then you just mark the ones that you feel that are frequent, that you really experience and feel um, and perceive frequently. And then the questions are just to reflect, okay, now let's look at the statements that I didn't sign, that I didn't you know, put uh, as frequent. What made you not mark them and try to justify, okay, I didn't mark this because... And then you, this could give you an idea of concrete ways or things that you can actually do to boost your resilience because it's the areas that you feel that are you know undermining a little bit your resilience and you can work on and how can you do something proactively to 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 become more resilient and then plan five steps or four steps or you know with a deadline it's also always about action planning right and have concrete things that you or at least one thing that you would like to do in order to boost your results, you could be investing in that relationship, solve that conflict. It could be something more related to, you know, I need to have improve or boost the specific self-care strategies, but I need to do it by this time. Yeah. And then the next exercise is just an overview. Think about your last day at work or last training that you delivered. And did you apply any of these strategies, selection, optimization? or compensation during you know this intense period okay so a little bit like look at the slides that i shared and then try to do the exercise finally just after all that we discussed we discussed resilience and ways to boost our relationships with stress management active and passive coping we discussed also growth mindset it could be some an, an area of improvement in terms of strategy and we also finalized with work recovery during the day of work or while working but also outside of work all these self-care strategies that we discussed, um, think about what do I have already in place and how can I reinforce my toolbox? How can I put more there or at least be more consistent with some of them that I know that work, but I'm not consistent enough and then develop nudges to make me more consistent in my self-care strategies, okay? And things that I'm, you know, a little bit like, okay, I will implement and when. And that's it. Thanks a lot. So a deck to further do your reflection and go deeper on the context that we briefly presented. Okay. <laughs> Thank you for even preparing this exercise booklet. We shared it in the chat, download it in the chat. And if you want to know more about the project and all the outcomes and everything, we will publish in summary, including the MOOC. You have the links also in the chat. But here, thank you so much, Liliana. That was really amazing. Such a huge bundle of tips now we only need to follow it and do it no which is the <laughs> it seems much easier than doing it right <laughs> i don't use them as i should i have to tell you it's also a work in progress okay so it's normal 